This is Peter. And this is Tom. And you're listening to History Teachers Talking Podcasts. All right, this is Peter Zablocki and Thomas Reska, and welcome back to the show. You know, we're recording this about a week before the year ends, and I think it's kind of like doing our laundry here, you know, in the sense that we decided to do an episode that kind of deals with just a bunch of random history facts. And a lot of the things here are, you know, in between these things are some ideas that we've been kind of bouncing around and, and talking about throughout the year that we wanted to do episodes on, but then we just realized that there just wasn't enough information or really enough to go on when it comes to these facts but we still thought that they were very interesting so there's just some facts Eric, there's some coincidences yeah. things of that nature just i don't know something that you might eventually become a jeopardy question somewhere maybe or exactly you, maybe you we might should have it like a, our jeopardy episode or like a trivia question if you're in like buffalo wild wings or something like that you know remember we went to uh hooters years ago we were in college and and it was a uh jeopardy not jeopardy but like a trivia night and we turned around and our history professor was yeah, history right professor. He's, like, he's like yo we come here every thursday or something like that we're like, oh. <laughs> and we're like oh hey yeah <laughs> he's with his son he was there with his son yeah yeah, yeah. that's what it was that's what it was funny but yeah so i guess this is like a trivia weird history you know airing yeah. out our laundry it's going to be all over the place it's going to be world history yeah. there's u.s history Any, everything just... presidents all over the place presidential Biden. government fun facts yeah so when i was looking at just like weird history um obviously a lot of things pop out zip code Right, just a zip code. We all we all know our zip codes. Do you know that zip code actually stands for something? I remember hearing that. I didn't know what it actually means. It stands for it zone, zone, it's yeah. zone improvement plan. Right, and then the idea was was chosen to suggest that mail will travel more efficiently and quickly, as in like zipping along when senders use this code in postal addresses. And it really kind of initially um, came out in um, 1963 as a basic format and then um, of five digits and then 83 extend the zip code plus four uh, additional digits were introduced which is kind of cool i didn't know that it stood for zone improvement plan but anyway random fact to get us going okay I, where do you want to where do you want to take this let's go with I don't, I don't know if i can top zip codes though pete i mean man i know i, don't, I know man start, i really started strong start, start, i started strong tonight start all right off. how about this one cleopatra we all know cleopatra right mm-hmm. was well, not name, actually Right, he, she was not actually Egyptian. Do you know that? I remember. Right? Yes, I did not. It is something that I have. Uh, she heard was. Before, yes, she was Greek. Yes, exactly. Right, and actually, um, she was also a descendant of Alexander the Great, Macedonian general. Right, although disputed whether he was Macedonian, or well, at least not Northern Macedonia. As that's a future movie. podcast. We'll go from there. We'll go. From also, there. did you know that Olympic Games um, between 1912 and 1948? held competitions in the fine arts. That's kind of cool. That. Like you could get medals, right? For literature, architecture, sculpture, painting, and music. I and mean, they eventually um, got rid of it. They decided to focus just on athletics. Yeah, they're like, let's just focus on like discus, which I thought was kind of interesting. Similar like with female gladiators, right? Ancient Rome also had female gla- gladiators. Um, gladiatrix, they were called. Uh, very rare, um, unlike their male counterparts. How about this place. one? Napoleon yeah, and all over the place. There's just some random, fun, weird history facts. How about Napoleon Bonaparte? Right, everyone knows Napoleon. Is this, is this the one with the um, the bunnies? The bunnies. Yeah, he, he got attacked by bunny by uh, rabbits. Well, basically, Napoleon and he he wanted he ordered five thousand rabbits because he, him and his generals wanted to go on a rabbit hunt. So he ordered all these rabbits. He put them in a big field. Right before they were going to do it, they let all the rabbits go, and instead of the rabbits running away and scurrying they all kind of like came together and just charged at napoleon and his generals and they just kind of bum rushed them and knocked them basically knocked them all off their horses they had to like get back on and like run away it was like a sea of rabbits basically five thousand rabbits just you know run these were like hares so they're, they're big they're not like the little the, these are some big rabbits not necessarily the little tiny ones you think of that like you see like in the pet store and they were they were like vicious too and they were attacking them bite go, going after them and everything Obviously, they get killed off. They run off. But he was attacked by this herd of rabbits. And it really, like, um, they talked about how it was very embarrassing for Napoleon and his generals that they got basically driven off the hunting field by uh, a herd of rabbits. Crazy. Crazy stuff. Um, Talk about animals. Did you uh, 
Here, the one about Pope Gregory the Fourth, the oh, yeah. So this, on this one, yeah, but this one actually had like a butterfly effect. Like that could be a future podcast, like butterfly effect type of things. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, it has your butterfly effect on like what happened. Yeah, he declares war on, on cats. Yeah, the- so he declares the war on cats in 13th century, right? And he says that black cats were instru- instruments of Satan. And because it is, right, he orders the extermination of basically any black cat that is found throughout Europe. So and the- other cats get killed, even if they have like black on them, they were killing them too, I think. Yep. So it greatly because reduced Satan cats. Yeah, it greatly reduced uh, the cat population in parts of Europe. And they said the butterfly effect, or how that uh, how that was a negative, was that then it had an increase in the number of rats that we started seeing in Europe, and these rats carried the fleas that carried the bubonic plague. So it actually increased the number of people dying and catching the bubonic plague because there weren't enough cats eating the rats that were carrying the fleas that that was carrying the bubonic plague itself. Uh, so since we are on animals, uh, how about Mary had a little lamb? The true story. One? The true story. True story. Right. Mary Sawyer was her name. She was an 11-year-old girl and living in Boston, um, 1860s. And she had a pet lamb that used to follow her to school. Yeah. And, then, and that's kind of where that comes well, then from. They, they, individuals saw it, wrote about it. And then she used – she then started like taking pictures with the lamb like, like for like charge people. And she used that money to, I believe, like fix a church. Yeah. Um, yeah see, these are little tidbits in history that kind of give you a little background, but they're not enough to do a whole – yeah show on so we're just kind of like a little like smorgasbord of uh information here right ketchup do you hear about ketchup yes i saw that ketchup used to be well go ahead but it basically uh it was sold as medicine medicine, 1830s right soda was too don't forget soda was it was like a medicine for a long time soda cocaine i mean cocaine well cocaine still uses it in some places but well initially yeah coca-cola um soda as a syrup and it was designed to help with indigestion. Um, and then eventually they kind of carbonated it. And then, you know, the whole Coke revolution started. But um, ketchup, 1830s, right? Became popular medicine. Um, in 1834, it was advertised ketchup as a cure for indigestion by an Ohio physician named John Cook. It didn't really become a, a condiment and popularized as such until late 19th century. Yeah, yeah, these ketchup is probably the most widely purchased like, condiment in the, in the in the country. I would think, right? Right, I would think so. It's got to be, be ketchup and then mustard, addition of mustard. But you see ketchup. I mean, people put ketchup in anything. Sometimes you put ketchup just to get like the kids to eat things, and the kids just eat the ketchup. Um, I remember yeah. years ago they had the different colored ketchup. Yeah, I was gonna say. Them. Remember green ketchup? I actually, when I was when I was green. teenager, I bought green ketchup. Yeah, I remember that. And then that I just couple, couldn't do it. They had a couple flavors. Yeah, it tasted yeah. the same. But I remember, yeah, of that, course. Yeah. Yeah. But they have all like I just the ketchups and. I put on my fries and I was like, I can't, I just can't do this. It was just not, it wasn't right. Um, pigs, uh, <laughs> Jared, this one that um, in 18, so I guess pig is food, but I mean, I guess, right? Uh, in 18, um, it's sorry. Pork. Thir- it's called pork, Peter. Exactly. I was going for that. In uh, 1386, a pig was executed in France. Uh, it says Middle Ages, right? A pig attacked a child who went to die later on from the wounds. And this pig was arrested, kept in prison, and then sent to court where it stood trial for murder and it was found guilty and then executed by hanging. This apparently happened in France in 1386. I know there was also one that you just reminded me that they – in you, you can actually find this online. I remember seeing uh, the video. Um, they actually hanged an elephant because hmm. the elephant went berserk and trampled some people. So they used like a crane. And actually, like, picked it up to like hang it by the screen, and it was more become more like a public spectacle than anything else. And it took so long for the elephant to actually die; it became this whole big animal rights. It, got, it was actually one of the things I think they said started ushering a lot of the animal rights um, movements in the country because they were doing this. But it was one of the first. I remember this. It was one of the first. Um, it wasn't a video. What, what was that before the video? When it showed all the pictures, you know, you take the picture and you like flip it, and you can like it looks like the picture's moving. It was one yeah, of those yeah, machi- yeah. it was one of those machines like that, and that was one of the first. I forget what those were called. Like you put like a quarter in, and you could watch the hanging of this elephant. That was like the big. That was like the big thing at the time. Huh. Yeah, awkward, I know. But yeah. <laughs> well, since we're talking about history, do you know that it is believed that roughly ninety seven percent of all history has been lost over time? Oh, I'm sure. Um, Just with the fire at Alexandria, right? 
Yeah. And they're saying like actually written accounts of history only started roughly 6,000 years ago. And modern humans, it is believed, appeared on this earth around 200,000 years ago. So think of it this way, 6,000 years ago, history has been written versus 200,000 years. So a lot of what we think we know is uh, is speculation that happened before that. Exactly. No, yeah. That goes in with uh, George Washington. Did you hear that fact? There's a, there's a lot of George Washington facts, Peter. Yeah, well, the George Washington, I know, I know, I know. Which, which George Washington facts? Well, so George Washington actually never knew that dinosaurs existed, period, because um, the first dinosaur skeleton wasn't discovered until, I think, 1824, and therefore um, George Washington was dead already, as were many other people, but he never knew that a dinosaur was a thing. Like, they didn't discover didn't those until afterwards. Well, it just gives an idea of, like, how old things are. Like, I saw this one fact about um, the oldest living tree. It's a bristol cone pine. It's actually in um, White Mountains, California. And when the last woolly mammoth died, when they can confirm or have some idea when the last woolly mammoth died, the tree was already a 1,000 years old. So the tree itself is um, actually here. It's dated as 5,067 years old. Uh, so it's kind of gives you an idea of like how old this tree is. It was already a thousand years old when the woolly mammoths died off and they died off about 4,000 years ago. So just, again, just, you know, talking about how like Washington didn't know about dinosaurs. And there's a lot of like obscure facts about presidents though. When you start looking into the presidential ones for uh, James Madison, for example, was mm-hmm. the first graduate graduate student from Princeton university. And then um, John Quincy Adams like, used to like to skinny dip in the Potomac River. I feel like I we talked that. about that one already. We talked about that one. Yeah, I know Abe Lincoln, the big thing with him was he was actually a um, – he had over 300 wrestling yeah. matches in his career. Yeah. And he only yeah. lost one that they know of. So he was actually like uh, – he actually earned his county's like wrestling championship and stuff like that. And that was one of the reasons why I remember reading about during the Civil War, there was a confederacy who was talking about possibly kidnapping Lincoln a few times and ransoming him. But they were like, there's no way we'll be able to do that because he's going to fight us all. Like he'll fight. We'll have to kill him. He's not going to do, he's not, Lincoln was like, Lincoln was a big guy. He's like six, four, you know, pretty muscular. He was, remember he's a rugged guy, uh, poor guy from Illinois for the most part. So he knew how to fight. And um, so they knew that, you know, he would put up a fight. They probably might have to kill him. So they didn't, they didn't go through with that uh, for the ransom anyway. But yeah, he was, uh, he was a big time wrestler. And like well-known in that area. So that's how a lot of disputes were settled. During those times, too, as people would just like wrestle, they weren't doing like, you know, pile drivers and stone cold stunners and things like that. But they would I think I'm almost wrestling. positive he he made it to the Wrestling Hall of Fame. He is, yes, he is. He is in honor of in, outstanding uh, American. Yeah, he's in the uh, in New Salem, Illinois. Yeah, he was an elite fighter. He actually is in, is in their re- Wrestling Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's better than Franklin Pierce, who had a little uh, drinking problem. So Franklin Pierce was also a president. Um, and his drink, he was the 14th president. Um, during his presidency, he was actually arrested for running over a woman with his horse because yep. he was drunk, apparently, or supposedly. Obviously, the charges were later dropped once they figured out that, like, you know, he was the president of the United States. So they're like, yeah, let, let that go. Ulysses S. Grant smoked a lot of cigars, about 20 a day. Especially during um, – well, that's where, that's where he died from, too. Yeah, he died from throat cancer in 1885, which – you know, Zachary Taylor with his cherries, don't forget. That's always. Yep. I'll uh, talk about t- cherries. How about Fidel Castro trying to be murdered and killed? I'm pretty sure that Fidel Castro was, I don't remember the exact number. Do you remember the number or have the number anywhere? It's like over over 480. Yep. And more than, so yeah, close to 500 plots to kill Fidel Castro. He was targeted by t- political opponents, criminals, uh, United States. The United States even hired a, a, the mafia to organize crime to try to get this guy. Oh, they had all they, that. Um, they sent in like female spies to kill him. They all wound up like falling in love with him. They said, "Yeah, tried poisoning his cigars." No, the cigar was the where they put in explosives in his cigar, explosives. and they uh, they lit it up, and then he was supposed to blow up in his face, but it didn't. And then they did. Um, they finally got to his butler who poisoned his milkshake because he used to love to have a milkshake every morning. And then Fidel Castro found out about it. So when the butler brought the milkshake over that morning, Fidel was like, "You drink it." The guy's like, no, you know, craziness. But, um, and you know, there's also the conspiracy that Fidel Castro, because um, many of the attempts on his life were by the United States government and primarily by J- um, John F. Kennedy, that he was responsible for trying to kill JFK. Well, talk about government doing some crazy things. How about prohibition? Right, again, I all over the place. This, yeah. um, government literally poisoned alcohol during prohibition, right? People continue to consume alcohol despite the fact that it was banned. So uh, law officials got really frustrated 
and decided to try a different kind of deterrent, um, ultimately death. Yeah. So they ordered the poison. <laughs> I know, it's so crazy. Sure. They ordered Imagine the- if that happened today, like what, like the government oh is goodness. poisoning anything, like on purpose. Oy. Nuts. Yeah. Nuts. Yeah, they ordered the poisoning of industrial alcohol manufactured in the U.S. That was obviously illegally manufactured, so they just ordered it to be poisoned. Um, and they were mainly because these products were regularly um, stolen by bootleggers. So the idea was that a bootlegger would steal these um, alcohol barrels that would be poisoned, and then someone would get back to the bootleggers like, "Yo, you sold me poisoned alcohol," and that would supposedly deter bootleggers from you know stealing more alcohol. Um, but technically, it says that. By the end of prohibition in 1933, the federal poisoning program is estimated to have killed at least 10,000 people. Like literally the, the federal government killed 10,000 people by poisoning alcohol. That's insane. Yeah. I mean, it's just one of those things that like, I got, I don't know who's, you know, why they thought that would be a good idea. I guess if people get sick from it, then they're going to not drink it at all. But the whole idea of prohibition was also just a bad idea. So crazy. The whole thing falls apart. Um, man, I had so many other. I had so many other good ones for presidents. I found a couple that I thought were um, coincidences. Let's move. I saw right, one go. that. Go to coincidences. So one that I thought was kind of interesting is well, you would know this answer if I just asked you. What year did um, Star Wars come out, Peter? The original. Seventy seven. Nineteen seventy seven. Right, May fifth, nineteen twenty fifth, nineteen seventy seven. Star Wars comes out. That was actually the same year that the last person in France was killed using a guillotine. Yes, I did see that, that was the last person. Uh, basically, he was um, uh, Hamida. Did he at least get to see Star Wars? Uh, he didn't get to see it. Yes, the pimp killer <laughs> Jabai was beheaded for torture and murder of a young woman, and he was the last person in France to be killed by the guillotine. No one else has been executed using. I thought you were going to say he was the last person to see Star Wars before he was killed by the guillotine. Uh, no, you know, he didn't. He didn't get a chance to see it beforehand. But it just kind of gives perspective. Like everyone, you know, people know Star Wars. Oh yeah, that movie. It comes comes out in the seventies, but then the, the French were still killing people using the guillotine back then. Crazy. Those. Well, that's like Anne Frank and Martin Luther King Jr. were born literally the same year, nineteen twenty nine. Yeah, yeah, like that's a coincidence. I think the coolest coincidence is, you have to say is the John Tyler one, right? Sure. The President Tyler. So John Tyler is America's tenth president, right? Um, he was born in seventeen ninety. So just kind of bear with me, John Tyler. America's 10th president, born in 1790. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He still has two living grandchildren. I don't think that's true. I think they just died. In, they in, just uh, died, right? This yeah, is like, as of 2018. So you figure. Like, but like this year, pretty recently, too. I think it was beginning, 2020. Of, beginning of December. The, See, the 2020 last, killed its awesome fact. Dang it. <laughs> the last one died. Oh. So this is, by the way, this is how it happened, right? Um, so this guy being born, you know, president being born in 1790. He was 63. When his son Lion was born, I mean, God bless the man, right? Sixty-three years old, yeah, right. And then his son Lion was seventy-one when his son Lion Junior was born in nineteen twenty-four, and then seventy-five when Harrison was born in nineteen twenty-eight, and both of those sons were alive until like apparently this year. That's wow. insane. Yeah, is that insane? It's That's like those- look at it this way, right? You could say like. There are people that could look at it, right, in at least 2018 and say, like, yeah, my dad was eight years old when the war started. And you're like, oh, yeah, World War Two, And they're like, ha, nope. Civil uh, war. World, World War One, Nope. War. Civil War. <laughs> Civil War. It's like my dad was eight when the Civil War started. Like, what? Yeah. I, know, I thought crazy. it was kind of a crazy coincidence. I, I don't know. Well, Super it's one cool. of those crazy facts, too, and in the fact that it just – it's because he married someone so young. Remember, you had, I think, just a couple of years ago, you had the, one of the last um, Civil War widows finally pass away. And it was she, she passed away in 2008, like the last confirmed one that she was still actually collecting a pension from the U.S. government because her husband fought in the Civil War. She was, he was like in, the, in his 80s when they married, and she was like 14, basically, very young. But uh, it happened the same year they were making it, um, talking about it because it was the same year. Um, like January of 2008, just when Barack Obama was inaugurated. That's nuts. Um, all right. Harvard University did not offer calculus classes for the first 10 years but after why? the school so was established. Because why calculus that? had not been invented yet. It wasn't even invented yet. Right? Yeah, modern That's calculus crazy. was developed in That's... 17th century Europe. That's crazy. Isaac Newton. Calculus yet. I don't even remember yeah. taking – I know we took calculus maybe a little bit, but 
Oh, oh I, saying, took, I took calc in high school. Say, just saying it scares me. I literally walked out of that class. I, I got super stressed out in the middle of a test and I just had a like an uber panic attack. I just got up, crampled my test, threw it in the garbage and walked out of the room. And I was panicking because I'm like, what the heck am I doing? Oh my goodness. Like I just walked out of the room and I was so freaked out. I didn't know what to do. So I just kept on walking and then I just walked out of the building and I'm like, oh my God, I just, yeah, I just cut school. That's not good. So I, I know. So I got in a car and I'm like, Oh my God, I just got in the car. What do I do? So like, again, I was like 18, 17, 18. I was in high school. So I went to the gym and worked out. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's never happened before or after. But yeah, calculus, calculus definitely freaked, is, freaked me out, man. That's what calculus can do to people. That's, that's what it did to me. Nuts. Um, Orville Wright, right? one of the Wright brothers that invented airplanes, was still alive when the Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed in 1945. And he was not happy about it. I know. It's not crazy. He wasn't happy. Not so much. I mean, obviously the atomic bomb, but just the fact that they took the airplane and the military turned it into this, you know, the bombers and the bomber fleets, which were just devastating throughout that war. And um, yeah, yeah, so he he was, he just, he was he quoted, just, yeah, yeah, he was but, quoted by saying like, we dare to hope we had invented something that would bring lasting peace to the earth, but we were wrong. That's kind yeah. of sad, right? He says basically like that's a, like regret all the terrible damage caused by like all the fires and you know they they basically discover how to do all this stuff but they also it's important to learn how to like he, he compared it to fire to like Ameri- uh, like America's not human beings discover how to make fire but you also discover how to put it out and that's what we have to do now like somehow find out how to use this new invention not just for war but for peaceful purposes also nuts. Well, it's like, all right, I'll do one more about like the weird years and then maybe hop in some other facts. But um, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, which is the last Harry Potter book to come out, right? I don't, I don't talk about oh. Harry Potter, God. I don't do that. <laughs> it was published in the summer. Actually, I remember going to like the midnight um, when it was being, you know, when the books came out, we go to these like midnight pre-order things where we would wait online and get our Harry Potter books. Yep, that happened. Whatever works. Yeah, right. But anyway, so it was published. uh, The last book was published in 2007. And at that time, a smartphone, the the official first iPhone was not yet released. It was released after the publishing of this book. So it just shows you how like how much the world has changed. Changed just in that time. Yeah, like, yeah, like Harry Potter, you know, all those books, the smartphone was not yet a thing. And it's just time flies when you have just to go off that and how the world has changed. Just think of this, like, I was watching some like older TV shows, not older, but just like 2015, 16 TV shows. And every time I see it now, I was mentioning to my wife, like when I see these people like go into like an office room or go into like a room and they're not wearing masks and they're not social distancing. I'm just like, oh my, I get like a little bit of anxiety. I was like, why are they not? Oh yeah, this is like pre-COVID. Yeah. Like it's just weird to see that now. I know, and, right? I don't think how much, yeah, COVID's changed. I, I can't imagine. And how much is it, you know, is it going to stick that? I mean, obviously things are going to change, but for the positive, but how much is this going to stick around? How much is, they said like shaking hands might be done. That's something a lot of people are talking about. Like when you shake someone's hand, when you first meet them, like a straight, you know, introduce that, that might be something that might go I like away. shaking hands. You well, can tell so much by the way a person shakes your hand. You just say, ah, can you sometimes? I don't know. <sighs> the fish handshake, you know, the fish. Oh, the fish ooh. one, yeah. But yeah. Ooh, ooh. All right. So let's keep on going with our weird history facts. Um, <laughs> I really do feel like we're airing out our laundry. Like, oh, let's just throw some more. All right, Alexander the Great, accidentally buried alive. Did you hear that one? I never heard he was accidentally. I know there's a lot of thoughts about how he died, but not that he was actually buried alive. So, yeah, they said he uh, suffered from a neurological disorder. And um, scientists now believe that he actually was buried alive. He wasn't really dead. He was just paralyzed, but still mm-hmm. mentally aware when they buried him, which is nuts. And of course, Alexander Great. I mean, this is a guy that like named a lot of different towns after himself. Pretty much everywhere he went, he conquered. He just like named a town after himself. Well, that's what you do back then. You conquer the the, the known world or most of the known world. You're going to do that, right? Um, who discovered America, Tom? Okay, you're putting one of those types of questions, right? <laughs> you, you want me to give you like the history teacher answer? Do you want me to give you the accepted answer? Do you want me to you know, like blow your spot? Like I don't know. I nah, I don't know. Know. I don't put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, that's I, I, All right, what's the real answer? Go. Leif Erikson. Yes, Leif Erikson was the first one to land on American shores. Well, you could even just say who knows, like Native Americans. You have that, but well, yeah, European, I mean they're walking, the first, walking over. Yeah, the first European. Yes. So the first, yeah, so you good point. 
the first European, Leif Erikson, right? 10th century, not Columbus. Uh, there's Columbus is getting a lot of hate lately too. Um, you know, with a, lot, a lot more stuff is coming. I don't want to even say it was really well known. I just think like curriculums around the country just didn't are, really are, talk are about just it. Like, well, we did like the other story of Columbus, you know. Yeah. And but the more and more like it's coming. I wouldn't say like I said it's not really coming out, but the curriculums are updating about Columbus. Yeah, he was not like when when the king and queen of Spain say we're not sending you there anymore because you're too brutal to the natives. That's telling yeah. you something, you know, yeah. like. Uh, it was funny when Luke was in, uh, I forgot what grade Luke was in, but um, one of his teachers asked if I could come in and talk about um, Columbus and the age of exploration. And I was like, yeah, you don't, you don't want me to come over and talk to you about the age of exploration. Yeah. Um, like what we're going to say is not, it's not the uh, coloring of the Mayflower pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some American well, history. Well, we get into um, Native Americans there. We can talk about basically everything like you know, the unknown or not the unknown, but the mis misled parts of history. Anything with the first Thanksgiving is just wrong. wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. It was not like a happy meal between the two of them. Like the whole story. It was like really no evidence. There was even Turkey there. There was probably no Native Americans even invited to the meal. Right. You had, you had all that. Yeah. Yep. It was just, yeah. Basically the whole thing was just kind of made up. I mean, it's a great holiday now, but the background of it is just not true. Um, how about the Puritans? They didn't really come into the new world for religious freedom. Oh, no. So they, pro- they, um, they didn't, yeah, they didn't like the freedoms. <laughs> yeah, I know. The Protestant separatists that left Holland or, you know, are Puritans. Um, they left Holland because of too much religious freedom. Um, the yeah. country allowed Judaism and Catholic, you know, Catholics and even atheism at the time. And it really got the Protestants. They're like, we can't, this is too much. And therefore the Puritans, you know, kind of hopped on a Mayflower and came over here to stifle some of that religious. They basically started starting more rigid um, colony that was going to follow very, the, that Puritan, that Protestant religion here instead of there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, What else got Uh, Walt Disney? Did you see this one? You know, even when I was little, I remember hearing this. Like, Walt Disney is actually like frozen. And that, in actually, case, you know, because he was not, that actually is not true. It's actually the yeah. exact opposite, right? Because he was cremated. <laughs> yes. So he, I'm, Someone, I'm laughing. Oh my god, why am I laughing? But he's not frozen. Yeah, you're a terrible person. He, he's not frozen. He was cremated. Yeah. Yes, and um, you're like ha ha ha. No, but one of my students um actually told me uh his name is ion my student um shout out uh told me that that's why it was funny but he said that's why they made the movie frozen so like disney made frozen <laughs> so like every time you think like disney frozen you you think of elsa as opposed to of like well they were trying to make uh that movie frozen but they were trying to make it disney for like 50 years like that was a movie like in long-term production like they kept on changing it i remember seeing a special on that we can do it. We can do a podcast on Frozen, <laughs> the Disney history of the Disney movies. Oh man, Pocahontas. Um, how about Andrew Jackson, a president, and his parrot Polly? Did you hear that one? Yes. Yeah, so he taught the parrot to basically um, curse like a sailor. Yeah, the curse like a sailor, and it was like crude, crude curse words that he would that this pirate, this pirate, this parrot would say all the time. Like visitors would come to the White House, and they just hear all this cursing and crude words, and they're like, "Oh, that's the president's parrot." And Jackson loved it. He like loved how it made people feel like uncomfortable and awkward. Like he just encouraged it more and more. And actually, at his funeral, um, they had to take the parrot out huh. because it was just just spewing out um, <laughs> curse words. So they're like, "Someone get this parrot out of here!" Like we we can't do this. It's kind of crazy. Um, Calvin Coolidge had many pets. Our president, Calvin Coolidge. Oh, I saw um, that. Yeah. Uh, he loved, you know, he had donkeys and bobcats. He loved them. Um, yeah, he also had a pair of lions. <laughs> yeah, well, when it basically got out that he enjoyed having pets or these exotic or different types of pets, when people from uh, these dignitaries or ambassadors from other countries, yeah, South here, Africa, they um, would bring government. they would bring these animals with him and give them to him as pets. Yeah, yeah. So he had a pair of lions. Didn't they have um, weird names? What they, didn't they have? Weird yeah, names? Uh, first one was tax reduction, <laughs> and the other ones was budget bureau. Yeah, well, like, <laughs> those are their names. Like, those are hor- like those are just uh, horrible names anyway. But for like a lion, you want to hear something like you know. Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey, and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics, and in turn, make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, but this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. 
We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show. King I, I, Leo Moonraiser, not like tax reduction. <laughs> I mean, Richard Nixon, um, do you know this, you know this one? Richard Nixon actually played five instruments, piano, saxophone. Yeah, he was a good right musician, there. right? Yep. He was also a little, uh, you know. Paranoid. Paranoid. I was looking for the right word. I was going to say intense, but I would not be an indicator of what well, I mean. I mean, he, he, had a, he had some plots put together, had these plots written up about how, like assassinating several journalists. Yes. Like the Washington Post, New York Oil. Yeah, hey, Jack way. Anderson from Washington, yeah. the Washington Commons. That were saying negative things about him. So he was like, you know, how can we find a way for him to just find an untimely end? And it's things like that. It was never actually enacted, but the fact that the president was doing stuff like that, it's not very presidential, basically. In the ideal sense, in the ideal sense. Well, again, since we're, again, all over the place, doesn't matter. Uh, July 4th, not r- the real Independence Day. No, you know no. That? Yeah, we, we that. bring it up to Yeah, we teach that. Yeah. I actually bring that up all the time. Yeah. Um, it is actually July 2nd. Uh, that is when the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia actually voted to approve the resolution of independence. Um, July 4th um, is when the Congress adopted the official Declaration of Independence, and most didn't even sign it until August. I think that's also um, when they, it was kind of announced more, right? That's one reason why yeah. I celebrated it, because that's when they, a lot of the people found out about it, was on the 4th. Yep. yep. They couldn't put um, it on Twitter like they could do now. Yeah. <laughs> it's legit now. Um, women were banned from smoking in public in New York City. Did you hear this one? I see. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well uh, there's a Katie Mulcahy. The Sullivan Ordinance. The Sullivan Ordinance, I think it was called. Right? Yeah, Sullivan Ordinance. Yeah, she got arrested for smoking. Um, and literally threw her in jail in 1908 in New York City because – and she argued. She's like, I, I could smoke cigarettes in public because men could smoke cigarettes in public. Why can't I do it? And they're like, because you're a woman. Boom, $5 fine two weeks later. Um, you know, uh, Actually, they, the law is eventually vetoed. But yeah, New York City got rid of it, yeah. Well, then it's funny how things changed. I remember in the 20s. Women were actually like encouraged to smoke more. If you look yeah. at a lot of the advertisements, they'd say like, "Oh, you want to smoke more? Get kind of that raspy voice. It'll help you find the husband." <laughs> like, it's insane. It's also going to get you throat cancer, but yeah, you might get yeah, a, yeah. You might get a husband out of it before then. Who knows? I don't know. Um. Anyway, um, what else we got? Um, bu- 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 there's one about Hollywood that I remember came across that that Hollywood is initially actually in New York City. And then it, the, like the film industry was in New York City. And then it moved. It, it moved to California based because of the different climates. Right. They, that. And also because of, um, what's his name? Uh, Thomas Edison. Because it said Thomas Edison had so many patents opened with all kinds of tools and things that were needed to make movies that they, a lot of this like indie movie makers just said like, we got to leave because this guy's going to like bleed us dry with everything. Every time they made a movie, they're like, oh, actually I had a part in that. I, I need to get paid. Um, yeah, so they went to the West Coast where they didn't have as many of the labor laws also, but also they, some of those things wouldn't follow through. Um, Winston Churchill typically smoke eight to 10 cigar- cigars a day. We know that Winston Churchill of England. Um, sometimes as much as 15. I mean, obviously he didn't beat, um, you know, our former president grant but Churchill. they were in the american prohibition right uh when churchill used to come to the united states um to visit fdr and whatnot he actually had a doctor's note with him that said that he needed to drink indefinite <laughs> amounts of alcohol when he would come to visit the united states like it was a doctor's note like he he needs to drink let let the men drink he's fighting the nazis let it happen no. well that's why the bad point actually prohibition was appealed but yes i get what you're saying yeah so so yeah, that, I saw some like things that they kind of are taught in history or taught in uh, it's not sure. Like the one big one was I remember seeing, you know, you always hear that Einstein wasn't good in math. Yeah. Which was actually totally fake. It was, that's false. It was actually, that's actually made up by um, Ripley's Believe It or Not column in the 1930s. And they said that actually um, a, a rabbi, a Princeton rabbi showed this story to Einstein in 1935 and Einstein just started laughing at it. He thought it was funny. Because he said he never failed a math test in his life, and that um, 
by the time he was 15, he actually had a had master differential and integral calculus. He had like degrees. So he, he was actually brilliant in math. Obviously, it's Albert Einstein. But they always say that. I know even in, you hear in school, oh, you failed this test. And where even Einstein, you know, failed these math tests sometimes. No, not true. Yeah, no. Yeah, Einstein no, he, didn't have to. He didn't fail. <laughs> you don't become the greatest mathematician or the greatest minds of all time and fail math. It just doesn't happen that way. So oh, no. sorry to burst that uh, bubble. That, that, that bubble there. But <laughs> um, 14 years before the infamous Titanic sank, author Morgan Robertson right, wrote this novella called The Futility. And um, it was about a large unsinkable ship, which he actually called the Titan, as opposed to Titanic. But uh, his ship, the Titan, his novella, hit an iceberg in the northern Atlantic. And what's even weirder is that the Titanic and the fictional Titan uh, did not have enough lifeboats for the thousands of passengers on board. And that's why most of them died. Kind of a weird Titanic, coincidence. There was this um, woman. Her name was Jessup. She, was, she worked for the British Red Cross. And she was actually on – she was a stewardess aboard the um, the three sister ships, the RMS Olympic, um, which actually collided with another ship in September of 1911 and was damaged uh, but made it back to port, no casualties. Six months later, she was aboard the Titanic again as a steward when it sank, all right? And then, then she was aboard the um, the HMS Britannic during World War One, which probably hit a mine and it actually blew up, causing the boat to sink quickly. She had to jump out on a lifeboat and she was actually stuck under the ship's propellers and suffered a head injury, but she survived. And um, she still returned back to work and worked for the same uh, shipping company when she recovered a couple of years later. But she was actually on all three of those sister ships at the, when they sunk or when they were damaged at one point. Hmm. Or that's just like, um, cra- that's just crazy bad luck. That's just right. I could talk about luck. That's like getting hit. That's like getting struck by lightning while you're being attacked by a lion or something like that. Yeah. Well, that's kind of how I feel about teaching sometimes. But um, <laughs> uh, anyway, also another thing about Titanic, since we're on Titanic, um, the owners actually never claimed that it was unsinkable. That was that was guy um, came out after the fact, like years later, right? Yeah, like the you know the unsinkable Titanic. No, that was not a thing. They never claimed that. And the population, the people that hopped on, I keep on saying hopped on, that went on to the um, Titanic, they were never really thinking that they were getting on a ship that you know whose claim was or its claim was to not sink. Like that was not really a thing. Which I thought that was kind of cool. Um, before alarm clocks. The way before smartphone alarms and alarm clocks, there were people called knocker uppers who would literally knock on people's windows to wake them up in time for work. I thought that was kind of crazy. I wonder if I would actually wake up. I barely wake up now. I I literally set up like I set like four alarms to get up. I don't know why. Might as well just not. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're not gonna have to wake up. Got 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 winter break now, so you can you can sleep in a little bit. I know. No, I gotta start planning ahead here. Um, so shortest war in history lasted 38 minutes between Britain and Zanzibar known as the Anglo Zanzibar war War occurred on August 27th in 1896. Um, I need to look into this 38 minutes. I, I, I thought that was kind of weird. Was that the, well, they also had the Falcon, I the Falcon wars, right? When they just basically, yeah, that was, that was a little longer shot, shot or yeah, shot, but it was like one battle, but they just used a cruise missile and they're like, all right, well, we can't win. Yeah. That was uh that was the like eighty right it wasn't nineteen eighty seventies eighties 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 um, I know well speaking of military then I saw this one I thought it was kind of interesting there was at one point in history in the nineteen fifties where Pepsi actually had a its own military and what? it and it ranked as the sixth largest military in the world at that time and what happened was basically the um, vice president of Pepsi attended an American exhibition in Moscow. And it was part of an effort to convince the Soviet Union the benefits of capitalism. Like, look, you know, we have all these different ideas. Even just when it comes to, like, you know, beverages, we have Coca-Cola, soda, all the, you know, Pepsi, all these different things. And Pepsi was a big hit. But the problem was the Soviet money wasn't really accepted worldwide. Like, Pepsi wasn't going to take Soviet money. It it wasn't accepted worldwide. It was also, like, the Cold War going on. So the USSR instead brought billions of dollars worth of Pepsi by trading submarines, military ships, and actually vodka for soda. So they just gave the Pepsi corporation all these submarines and military ships. So if you collected all that amount, instead of cash, it was like, it was like, you know, they bartered for it basically to get all this Pepsi. And uh, for a brief time, Pepsi had the sixth largest military in the world because of all the surplus 
submarines and warships that that they that the Soviet Union gave them. Um, they eventually sold all of it for cash, and they scrapped all the submarines for um, the scrap metal, and they were able to make a lot more money doing that. But Pepsi actually had its own military and its own. It was pretty that, big. and they they created Santa Claus. Like there's you know, Pepsi and Coke. You know, Pepsi and Coke. That's I know. I just raised like a whole thing. We just talked what? about last year, man. Last class. What are you doing? Oh, Our cast, man. Last class. <laughs> last, I know. last class podcast. Um, I'm fried. All right. So uh, Long week. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> uh, hey, it's the end of the year. 2020. 2020. Finishing it high. 2020. Um, Adolf Hitler helped design the Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, yeah, it was Hitler and Ferdinand Porsche kind of got together. The and they're like... Right? Yeah, and they're like, yeah, let's let's do this. And they wanted an affordable, uh, practical car. Volks meaning people, Wagen meaning um, car, vehicle. So Volkswagen literally means people's car. Um, and their premise was kind of like recreating what Henry Ford had done years prior with um, the Model T. Like a cheap car that could be assembled quickly that every, that people could afford and that it would basically yeah. you know, create a booming middle class. That was the idea or the hope. Well, actually, the first car was not. See, that's another mis, uh, misconception. Yes. The first car was well, not. Misconception. I think it's one that I don't know if it's a misconception that's out there. I know what you're going to say, but I think it's more of just what people assume. Because the automobile is so synonymous with the United States. And with Henry Ford, yeah. Henry Ford, Maybe. but yeah, I don't know. It's, I don't think, I don't remember. I don't know was actually taught that Henry Ford made the first car, invented the car, which is not true. I, I, don't, I don't think that's it. He, it was invented in Germany. Yeah, in Germany. Um, and they, they were worth a lot of Europe. France had some like early models, but yeah, Germany was the main one, right? Yep. Do you know that since at the end of World War I, over 1,000 people have died from leftover unexploded bombs? Yeah, um, that. yeah it's, it's still fine. Them. Not too long ago, they found, some, to they found yep. some on the beaches of uh, Normandy for D-Day. I remember seeing that, like, watched, like, the tide finally turned up some uh, ordinances there. Yeah, it says that it actually interesting. It says four percent of Normandy beaches are made up of shrapnel from um, from D Day landings. That means that more than f- more than five thousand tons of bombs were dropped by the Allies on the Axis powers as part of the prelude to the Normandy landings. And well, um, about it, it makes sense, Pete, right? Because you look at these like ancient battlegrounds, like with the like with Rome, Alexander the Great. And you actually can dig, and you'll find like you know swords, you know, and artifacts from these battles. So it makes sense that our battles, like the 20th century, 21st century battles, there's going to be things left behind too when you really think about it, you know? Nuts. Nuts. Those things. Bum, bum. Um, shrapnel itself is named after the inventor, British Army officer Henry Shrapnel. First person to invent an anti-personnel shell that could transport a large number of bullets to its target before releasing them. Oh, well, that was interesting. Although that kind of we probably talked about that, or maybe we missed that one when we talked about it. You're being named after a, a way to kill people. That's a nice, uh, yeah, I know, right? Memory. Oh, um, I see. all right. What else you got? I have a lot. I, oh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I was able to find uh, going through. But Adolf Hitler's nephew fought against the Nazis in World War II. During the Second World War, William Patrick Hitler um, later changed his name to William Patrick Stewart. Um, Wow, how random, right? Was drafted into the United States Navy where he served as a hospital corpsman. Um, corpsman. So uh, throughout the war until 1947, right? He was wounded in action and was awarded the Purple Heart and went to gain American citizenship. So his nephew, William Patrick Hitler, lived in the United States, yeah. changed his name to William Patrick Stewart, and served in the United States Navy in World War II. That's a crazy story. Well, I know there's actually a documentary on Netflix I've been watching a while ago. It's called like My Name is Hitler. And it's about like these different families that live in, in the United States and in Germany. And they're, they have, they're, there's no physical, there's no biological relation to Hitler, but their last name just is Hitler. And it's like how his life growing up. And it's, it's about one of them is this one teenage girl. And she's debating whether or not of like changing her last name just because of like, it's what it's synonymous with. You know, that's nuts. Because they're not related to him at all, but it's just, that's just their name. Like it would be like, you know, it was a pretty common last name, I guess, or a name that other people would have, just like a, a Johnson or a Smith type of deal. So that is not, that's so not, I mean, Hitler and I growing up. I know a lot of people uh, based on, um, stuff like that. I remember when I was teaching that years ago, I came across something that said that there was, uh, I think close to like 30 or something, um, Hitler's in the New York phone book, um, yeah. 
before 1939, and by 1940, there was none of them. Yeah, they all changed their last name, yeah. They all just changed their last name, yeah. Well, yeah, um, you, you look it up, Hitler, I'm going to go punch you. know, they, it's just how people a lot of times react during those times, you know? Uh, 19, from 1940s to the 1970s, Yale, plus other Ivy League schools like Harvard and Brown, required their freshmen to pose nude for a photo shoot. What? Yeah, the goal was to that nuts, right? The goal was to gather material for a massive study into how rickets developed, and that involved sticking pins to the backs of their subjects, male and female. So generations of uh, countries elite who went to the Ivy League schools um, post, um, and the archives included the naked photos of well-known figures ranging from George W. Bush, Hillary Clinton, and Meryl Streep. The photos were destroyed after news leaked, and the study was denounced after nineteen um, seventies. Crazy! Imagine, that, imagine, that, that sounds like something like some crazy. Like, yeah, that's uh, like starts a college in his basement now. Would be like, yeah, that's yeah like I Harvey to, Weinstein thing. Like, yeah, uh, I, need, not, I need to take these pictures of you. Yeah, before yeah, you want to go to Yale, get yeah. naked. Like, I need what? To take a picture of you, and it's it's for it's for a Rickett study. Like, what? Wait, wait, wait. Excuse me. Oh, uh, I forgot. I can't believe you didn't mention this one. Abe Lincoln. Um. Also licensed bartender, 1833, yeah, opened up a bar. Um, it was called Barry and Lincoln with his friend William Barry uh, in New Salem, Illinois. I did not know that. Imagine if it was like more successful. Like <laughs> yeah, Barry and Lincoln, the bar. Imagine yeah, if they hit it big. There, he's like, forget the presidency. I'm just like, gonna like, stay. How, like, like how like, different the world would be. Yeah, I'll just stay with Barry and Lincoln. You know. Um, well, anyway, the shop closed. Uh, Barry Lincoln closed because Barry happened to be a raging alcoholic, um, and he wound up consuming most of the shop supply. So Lincoln's like, you know what? I'll do something different. I'll like become president or something. Um, <laughs> so that, uh, it's that. Um, uh, in nineteen ninety, I remember seeing this when I went to Philly. Uh, in nineteen ninety eight, twelve hundred bones from some ten human bodies were found in the basement of Benjamin Franklin's house. Um, so you're like, wait, what? But actually, um, what happened is he would buy these cadavers, um, and he would study, you know, anatomy. So that was actually common back then too. Like yeah, body, a lot of people human like bones and human remains. It was a very common uh, practice that people just because they didn't have all these other ways of of exploring that or studying that as they do now. Nuts. Um. All right, what else you got? I have one more that I thought was kind of interesting. All right, let's do um, one more. You know, it, especially since it's like a hometown guy from right here from Jersey. The idea, and hopefully, Tom- you know, hopefully, it's better than my zip code that I started with. Oh, it's a little bit, a little bit. I would say it's better than the zip code. Yeah. The idea <laughs> that Thomas Edison invented a light bulb is actually false. Yes. Um, Edison has a record number of patents over over a thousand, like a thousand ninety three, but most of them weren't his own inventions. He was just really smart, and what he would do is he would find real inventors and then steal their ideas before they could take credit for it. So he would basically figure out how what they did, get their ideas, get their blueprints, go and file a patent for it. And he did the same thing with the light bulb. So he, a lot of times he got the patent for the light bulb in 1880, but the f- true creator was actually a British astronomer and chemist by the name of Warren D. LaRue, who actually created the first um, light bulb 40 years earlier in 1840, but he never got pat- he never got the patent for it. Um, Edison did, so Edison is accredited with you know, the father of invention, all, you know, making all these new inventions. And really he just was quicker to the patent office than others. Hmm. So I guess to finish this up, um, kind of just, I guess, in, in celebration to uh, the fact that, you know, we started this kind of as like a COVID hobby and it's really grown since then. And, you know, we really enjoy doing this every week. Hopefully you guys enjoy listening to us. Um, Russia ran out of vodka celebrating the end of World War II. Yes, I did. Um, yeah. When the long war ended, street parties engulfed the Soviet Union, they said, and it lasted for days until essentially all of nation's vodka reserves ran out literally within 22 hours after their parting started. That's a, that's a big population, and that's a lot of vodka. Well, that makes – I mean, 25 million Russians died in that war, right? Yeah. Not even so, oh, so I guess they were happy that it was over, right? You're going to be celebrating when it comes to an end, yeah. <sighs> so uh, as we – as we kind of said in the beginning of this podcast, this that was, was all over the place. That was literally just like that was just all over the place. A lot of weird history out there, though. There's a lot of weird things that happen in history. Yes, so, uh, uh, weird coincidences, occurrences, stuff, mis, mis, misconceptions. Facts, yeah, airing <laughs> out our laundry, just throwing everything out there. Um, we will be back next week with uh, 
something a little bit more focused. Um, but until then, thank you so much, guys, for you know turning in. And do not forget to um, follow us. We are on Facebook at History Teachers Talking um, Podcast. We're also at historyteacherstalkingpodcast.com, on Twitter and Instagram. So uh, wherever you guys listen to your podcasts, um, please do click the subscribe button. Again, we don't get paid for this at all, but um, at least that way you guys get our episodes quicker. That's it. Yeah. Just uh, thanks for the support and um, send us an email. Let us know any topics you might want us to discuss further. Maybe you heard one of these things and uh, you say, hey, can you give us a bit more information on that? Just let us know. Cool. Sounds good. So happy new year, everyone. And uh, enjoy. Happy Take new care. year. Stay safe. Stay safe. I hope everyone enjoyed our podcast, and if you would like to email us, you can do so at historyteacherspodcast at gmail.com. Hey, podcast listeners, I'm Paul Brandis introducing my podcast, Countdown to Dallas. It's a fascinating, in-depth look at the seemingly unconnected events that led to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It's based on my book of the same title. In that book and in this podcast, I go all the way back to 1939, when Lee Harvey Oswald was born into a troubled and dysfunctional family. I'll follow his transient and often violent teenage years and young adulthood, painting a fuller picture of the man who would later become Kennedy's killer. I also take a look at events unfolding in that era, like Cuba and Vietnam, and I'll unpack the conspiracy theories too, not one of which has ever been conclusively proven. Subscribe to Countdown to Dallas at evergreenpodcasts.com or your favorite listening app, October 31st.